Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at a very exciting upcoming title, especially for fans of historical strategy gaming. Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign is a sequel to the 2005 game Knights of Honor, and I'm excited to see another game coming around to shake up the scene and introduce some additional competition into the mix of historical strategy gaming. This is a space dominated by only a couple of mainstream games, franchises, and in fact developers, so hopefully this will ensure they can't quite rest on their laurels. And taking a look at the dev diaries and everything that's been revealed so far, things are looking very promising. There is a lot to talk about, so without any time to waste, let's dive right on in. The Gameplay Loop One of the key standout elements of Knights of Honor, and subsequently now Knights of Honor 2, is the fully real-time approach to the game. While the game is similar to Total War games in that it is divided into a larger campaign map and zoomed in battle maps where you can take control when armies collide, unlike the Total War series, both the campaign and the battles take place in real time. In some ways, Knights of Honor provides that often desired blend of Paradox style campaigns and Total War style battles. And much like the former of the two, at least, the game is not necessarily about painting the map to win. Fame and prestige can be gained through various actions and events like winning wars, ending rebellions, or participating in crusades, as well as by accomplishing certain key tasks like holding important cities, producing certain unique goods, or building important buildings. There are 15 rankings across 5 categories of wealth, conquest, culture, society, and politics, and the player can try to come out at the top of whichever of those fits their playstyle. Vassals generate prestige for their liege lords as well, and marriages can help accumulate prestige too. Once a kingdom has its prestige rise above a minimum threshold and be among the nine with the highest prestige, it starts being considered a great power, giving significant bonuses to army morale, stability, and cultural influence among neighboring kingdoms. It also allows the kingdom to try and become the Emperor of the World, a carryover from the first game that is a show of the top nine kingdoms picking between the top two kingdoms upon whom to bestow even further benefits. Players can proclaim themselves Emperor of the World without an election, though other great powers will likely get upset and declare war over that proclamation. To properly get such a title, the kingdoms need to schmooze and develop good relations or be otherwise extremely important as far as the realms in the world are concerned in order to get support from the other great powers when it comes time to vote. These were a few ways in which Knights of Honor and now Knights of Honor 2 make it so that players don't just have to paint the map to win, and can win by accomplishing more diplomatic and economic or cultural feats instead. But we're talking about all these great powers and major cities, all that means next to nothing without context, so what's the context? The setting. Knights of Honor 2 is set during the High and Late Middle Ages, meaning it spans from around 1000 AD to about 1500 AD. This is a very rich period of history in the region, so it's hard not to get excited about the various factions and factors at play. Multiple start dates helps add more variety to the game, meaning more faction options for example, as some kingdoms didn't exist until later on, or some existed only in place of others down the line, or, you know, as precursors to future kingdoms. So you can either kick your game off at the start of the 12th century, in the 1220s, or in the mid 14th century. That's a pretty wide range of timelines, giving you a wide range of options. Mods will also allow for custom start dates and custom starting situations beyond that as well, so I'll be curious to see what other options come of it. Unlike the first game, this game includes Arabia, bringing in some fairly crucial cities when it comes to the Islamic world, and we can expect to see a fair bit of cultural, political, social, and religious diversity as a result. On which note, the importance of culture. Culture plays an absolutely massive role in this era, and as a result, in this game as well. There are plenty of cultural subgroups across the regions of the map, and Knights of Honor 2 intends to dive into the nitty gritty. We're not just seeing generic Arabs or Nords, we're seeing, and pardon my butchered pronunciations, but we're seeing the Tuareg, the Sanaja, the Zenata, Normans, and many, many more, as well as the usual, you know, French and Arab, etc, etc. This level of detail is nice to see since it makes the world that much more colorful and since cultural tensions play a major role in how people feel about their conquerors. This level of detail will be a source of more tension and pushback as kingdoms grow and spread, just like it was in real life. 
culture plays into resistances and rebellions against occupying forces, and it spreads between borders, like in the real world as well. Provinces influence the cultures of neighboring provinces, and that in turn can influence how a kingdom decides to conquer territory. For example, if the culture they consider to be their own spreads into a province that belongs to another kingdom, they might have an easier time quelling the population of that province post-conquest than a province where there is no cultural connection. As you can maybe expect, the cultural spreading and influence is more likely to happen among cultures of the same group, and there are other methods of spreading culture that we haven't yet seen, but I can see it being an interesting gameplay layer in basically preparing a province for your inevitable conquest, or otherwise having a province stand up against its current ruler in defiance. The Iberian Peninsula was used as a bit of an example where cultural tensions can be very interesting. If a Catalan king takes a Castilian province, the cultural transition will be relatively smooth. An Andalusian king, however, would not have that luxury. Now imagine that kind of interaction across the entire map, and you can see why I like there being a fair bit of fracturing in the number of cultures being represented on the map, considering the gameplay impact. Beyond mechanics, you'll see names and titles are culturally appropriate, as are the architectural styles, garments, castles, and units too. Real historical dynasties are referenced in the game, and overall, culture is playing a strong role not just in creating a rich tapestry of visuals and historicity, but also in creating tension and pushback, like I was saying earlier, against conquests in the game. Again, like they would in real life. This makes me really happy to see that culture plays such a big role in so many ways. And cultural differences aren't the only thing playing such a major role in representing the era. Religion Following culture is the importance of religion. Though it's a very hot topic for the era, the dev diary dedicated to it suggests that it's not a central element, though it does influence all aspects of your kingdom. I'm very curious to see how those two sort of separate thoughts reconcile against each other when the game actually comes out. But yes, the devs have said it's not a central element, and yet somehow it will influence all aspects of your kingdom. So how does that work? Either way, there are three religious families in Knights of Honor 2. Christianity, Islam, and Paganism. Though the devs had considered splitting these down into all of their sects, they decided instead to keep things a little simplified, leaving Christianity as either Catholic or Orthodox, and Islam as either Sunni or Shia. As you can imagine, religion plays a role in how kingdoms feel about each other. Sharing a religion or a religious family means you are more likely to get along. Trade agreements, military alliances, and marriages flow more freely and with less hesitation. But apart from external relations, internal affairs are also impacted by religion. Provinces have their own religious leanings, and as you might imagine, when a province and its greater realm don't have matching religious beliefs, there's room for tensions to arise. Once more, religions from the same religious families work better together, though with a bit of friction, whereas religions from different families will have a much harder time cooperating. As you can imagine, buildings are also either more or less effective or entirely useless depending on religion. A monastery doesn't do much for Muslims, and Christians aren't going to gain much from a madrasa. In order to counteract this and potential tensions, you'll use clerics, scholars, and shamans to preach in provinces, an expensive action that will slowly convert them over to the realm's religion, converting buildings appropriately as well, and even allowing some benefits to be made from religious settlements that don't line up. When not converting provinces, these same clerics, scholars, and shamans can instead be used to generate certain resources, faith and books, and those can help boost your kingdom's culture and turn it into an important destination in combination with certain buildings. This, I think, ties into the Emperor of the World conversation we were having earlier. Meanwhile, if particularly religious characters in your realm have the charity skill, they're also able to perform an additional action that helps promote stability in the realm. At the end of the day, though, you can always choose to adopt a new religion, though it might cause uprisings and some characters might leave your court. If you find more of your kingdom follows a different faith compared to what it used to, changing the state religion might prove easier and more beneficial in the long run rather than trying to convert provinces one by one by one. As with other aspects, religion is another way you can shape your kingdom. On which note, let's talk about shaping your kingdom. The kingdom is what you play as in Knights of Honor 2. If I were to draw a comparison, you can think of it like Total War or Europa Universalis rather than Crusader Kings. 
No matter what happens to your current king or queen or to the various knights and characters in your kingdom, the kingdom lives on. So while all these characters might die and take their traits and skills with them, the kingdom itself needs a sense of continuity and that comes in the form of traditions. Rather than using a old school tech tree, kingdoms will have a choice of traditions to adopt, sometimes swapping old traditions out for new ones to reap the benefits across the realm, to provinces and characters both. Since these have such a large and drastic impact, they're a little challenging to acquire as well as expensive, costing a fair amount of gold and books. Beyond that though, you'll need to have a character in your kingdom that has personally mastered the corresponding skill, and you'll need to be picky since you can only have a maximum of 8 traditions at a time, with slots being unlocked as you gain more prestige through your actions. Each of the traditions can be upgraded by spending more gold and books, and they can provide stats boosts, or access to new actions, abilities, and equipment, as well as benefits to characters in your realm, especially again those that have the corresponding skill. And as those traditions level up, you can see how extra abilities are added to characters with said corresponding skill, each with their corresponding uses, like pursuing retreating troops or leading particularly sizable cavalry contingents here under the cavalry tactics tradition. The thing about traditions is that once they're unlocked, the characters in your realm can learn the relevant skill as a result of it being a tradition in your kingdom. They will still get a random selection of skills to choose from based on their own affinities as well, but the kingdom traditions will guarantee at least some options so you can start to make strategic choices accordingly. And I quite like how this works. Basically, you need a character in your realm who is sort of particularly interested in a certain lifestyle, let's say, or in a certain approach to the world. And because of their leaning into that certain approach, you can adopt that approach as a kingdom tradition, sort of using that person as a source of inspiration, let's say. And once your kingdom has established something as a tradition, all of your other characters can aspire to sort of line up with the kingdom's expectations, and so now they can learn that corresponding skill themselves as well. There's this really nice loop, it's very characterful, pun entirely intended of course, and I'm really curious to see how it works out, if there are any overpowered combinations, or if things balance out quite nicely, because I do like the fact that different characters will have different affinities to different skills, but we'll touch more on that later. Let's focus back on dealing with your actual kingdom and its various parts and pieces, because Beyond the more intangible elements such as traditions, there are of course quite physical elements to your kingdom as well that you'll be managing and shaping, such as provinces and settlements. Provinces and the cities, villages, farms, castles, and religious centers within them are all going to need your supervision as you grow your realm, each providing a distinct set of benefits or resources. Each province has just the one town acting as its political center, which is where you can actually make decisions about the province as well as see details. Beyond this town, however, there are typically five to six more small settlements, at times more, at times less. These smaller settlements can be of four different types. Villages as centers of population and commerce, farms to produce food and other goods, settlements with religious importance that generate books and faith to represent education and religion, and castles used to help with defenses and recruitment. These minor settlements can also be considered coastal if they fit the bill, which unlocks even more options related to being coastal. As you construct buildings and upgrades in a province, you'll be looking to synergize the various settlement types with the structures you're building, taking advantage not just of the settlements, but the province features as well. From flax fields and cattle farms and mines, to gold veins and amber deposits and salt, provinces will have natural and man-made resources that make them worth fighting for. These province features will also allow the construction of unique buildings and upgrades, some of which will give access to entirely new resources, which in turn will give access to entirely new buildings. An example that was given was herb gardening. It can only be made where the herbs province feature is available, and through it, kingdoms can make upgrades like herbalist shacks, dye workshops, apiaries, candle makers, etc., and thus produce resources like herbs, dyes, wax, candles, and more. And these all have usage in textiles, medicine, naval buildings and upgrades, so on and so forth. So it's very interconnected, it's very intertwined, and I'm very excited to see the level of complexity and the number of goods and resources and province features that'll be made available, because I feel like that could really 
make you feel like you're ruling your kingdom in sort of a custom way. You know, do you want to be known as the greatest candle makers of history? And so you go around conquering all the places that make the best wax. I don't know, this is a silly example, but I quite like the idea of it and I'm excited to see where it goes. Now, presumably, access to certain goods will give you an edge over other kingdoms, either militarily or economically or otherwise. In order to bolster the replayability in this sandbox, the developers will actually be randomizing the makeup of provinces a fair bit. Though they will of course be keeping things within reason. You won't get vineyards in the Sahara or camels up in Scandinavia, but there will be some degree of randomization within regions. That means you won't pursue a set path in each playthrough, instead needing to adapt your conquests to your overall strategy. It's a matter of finding that sweet spot between historicity and gameplay, and I think this could definitely make things interesting, though I hope they have made a mode or setting that allows people to play as a realistic depiction of the regions. I don't want to be making champagne in, I don't know, London, I guess. I also hope to see seeds being exposed so that you can choose to replay the same map over and over if you've come across one that's particularly interesting or worth sharing. I like the idea of this randomization as it encourages different directions of expansion in each playthrough, forcing players and the AI to deal with new challenges in new playthroughs. Internal Affairs Just as you must deal with the intangible traditions and physical spaces of your realm, so too must you deal with its people. This is where the royal court comes in, an integral part of the game introducing a whole array of mechanics and systems. The Royal Court in Knights of Honor 2 isn't meant to be a realistic depiction of the historical court and is instead more like an Arthurian round table of trusted advisors with knights and members of the royal family. The sovereign is always in the court and they are joined by up to eight knights of different classes. Marshals, the most efficient military leaders, are able to lead larger armies and get access to military specific skills. Merchants are best at finding the most profitable deals when working with other kingdoms. Diplomats help in making friends or cooling off the embers of hate between enemies. Spies are to be used offensively to create spy networks and shatter kingdoms from the inside, and clerics, meanwhile, can keep a realm stable by calming its people and halting the spread of heresies and foreign faiths. Knights can be assigned as governors to provinces to garner better benefits from the region while also applying more benefits to the region based on the class being assigned. A merchant might boost financial matters, while a cleric might deal with religious issues. These members of your court will all require a salary, and failure to pay them or a lack of crown authority on your part might see them change their banners pretty quickly. That's not the only way to lose a knight, of course. Sometimes battle or time will do the trick instead, and you'll find yourself needing a replacement, something that can hurt quite a bit if the character in question was particularly skilled. Over the course of their illustrious careers, these knights can gain up to five skills, each with three ranks, and they're able to acquire these skills pretty quickly, either learning through experience or through the expense of gold and books as resources. While the pool of skills are shared between classes, letting everybody develop in any direction, each character will show certain affinities in certain directions, and their class will also determine if they glean any extra benefits from specific skills. So there's still a value in synergizing here, but you do have a bit of freedom. Skills apply to rulers as well, and between the class, the governor status, and the level of a given skill, you'll see a variety of buffs and new unlocked abilities and options such as new battle tactics. An excellent example is with the bargain skill that lets merchant class characters generate more wealth from trade, but for spies and diplomats, it instead lowers the cost of certain actions. For a governor, meanwhile, the same skill increases income from the price of goods, while the king will see reduced costs to hiring knights in the royal court. I really quite like how the same skill means something entirely different across different classes. You're applying that skill in different ways based on what your job is, and I think that's quite a nice touch, making things feel rather similar to, again, real-world examples. Now, internal affairs go beyond just these knights of the royal court, though, and that's where crown authority and opinions come in. Working in tandem, they represent how the people feel about you in charge, not as individuals, but in their respective classes. While you can't directly impact opinion beyond the work of a skilled diplomat, it is something you'll need to keep an eye on. Nobility opinion can have an impact on how your neighbors feel about you, how much crown authority you have, and what the chances are of a revolt. They are hard to please. Victory in war and crushing rebellions do the trick, 
but they're very easily upset by diplomatic decisions, military losses, and financial instability. The army opinion determines morale and obedience, and if they're unhappy, you can bet they'll march against you. Military successes, provisions, and not leaving soldiers behind keeps the army happy, but abandoning troops or their leaders will gravely upset them. Merchants help generate wealth and tackle corruption, kept happy with growing trade opportunities and the construction of appropriate buildings and upgrades, but quick to anger with bad diplomacy with trade partners, bankruptcy, or war. The clergy, meanwhile, will help with the spread of religious influence or the production of books as a resource, and their happiness is determined by the actual faith of the realm. Catholics will want to see better relations with the Pope, Muslims will want to see the same for caliphs, involvements in crusades and jihads will make a difference, so depending on which religion you're a part of, your clergy will have different expectations from you, and pagan shamans, meanwhile, will care more for military prowess and see success or failure as gifts or withdrawal of divine favor from the gods. The peasantry, meanwhile, is most easily appeased, since most buildings and upgrades appeal to their needs, but they are made upset by rebellions and the declarations of war. Unhappy peasants can hurt food production, and that can incite more rebellions. Stability and revolt risk are two factors that determine the likelihood of internal strife tearing at your realm. Crown authority can be increased to counteract these factors, though it can be quite expensive to do so, and you can take measures such as cutting taxes if need be as well. Sometimes, however, the overwhelming negative sentiment will be hard to overcome. Famine, excessive war exhaustion, or even the death of the king. At a local level, assigning the right governor or building the right buildings can help increase overall happiness as well as your local authority. Individual provinces might stay loyal if properly taken care of, even when the rest of the kingdom is ablaze. Naturally, the flip side is going to come up quite often. Cultural and religious tensions will flare, and newly conquered territory will have some resentment. Rebellions don't just suddenly blow up in your face, though. They fester and grow, and this is represented in Knights of Honor 2 through the rebellious population. This population grows and grows, refusing to pay tax, being inefficient in their duties, and refusing to join the army. Eventually, the size of this rebellious population tips it over the edge, and a rebellion kicks off. It sounds like the size of the rebellious population simply increases the chance of a rebellion. It's not a trigger on a numerical threshold, and I quite like that unpredictability. You know that there is this sort of boiling pot full of bubbling water, and you're not sure when it's going to start overflowing. And at one point, it hits that tipping point, and you're left scrambling. And I, again, quite like that unpredictability. On which note, you never know when a certain event or foreign intervention from spies might trigger a rebellion, and you never know if somebody previously loyal to you decides to leave your court because you made a particular decision that upsets them, like changing the state religion. And heck, sometimes it's just bad luck. A bunch of crusaders decide to pillage your provinces rather than go where they're supposed to, and you're left dealing with the mess and a very unhappy population. There's also always a chance that famous rebels, that is to say, rebellions led by particularly potent characters, might lead their rebellions into your territory from a neighboring kingdom. This isn't something that happens often, but the chance is there, and so preparation is key. Once a rebellion pops, you'll see rebel armies, occupied provinces, zones of operation, and a hierarchy. The rebel leader will lead the largest rebel army, with the second in command leading the second largest, and then a bunch of smaller rebel armies too. The second in command takes charge if the leader dies, and should the rebellion continue unchecked or otherwise succeed, they might form their own independent kingdom, join a neighboring one that they're aligned with, or reform an old lost kingdom. When fighting a rebellion, you have to take into consideration a few potential strategies. Do you eliminate the smaller armies and try to weaken the rebellion? Do you try to hit the leader first to get them to hopefully disperse right away? Or do you try to use them in more clever ways, trying to push them against your enemies in return for favors? You can also look to instigate rebellions in enemy kingdoms, turning their knights into your rebel leaders, or otherwise getting a marshal to betray their king, maybe even joining forces with rebels in enemy territories to further your own cause. I love how rebellions sound rather varied. It's not just always a matter of defeating them in battle, with different approaches suitable for different circumstances. Your direct involvement in their quelling or occurring is also of particular interest to me. And that takes us to our next point of conversation. In-depth diplomacy. We've spoken at length about internal affairs, now it's time to talk about external affairs. 
Naturally, your interactions with other realms will play a huge role in any playthrough of Knights of Honor 2, and there are quite a few ways things are made interesting here, and different from not only the usual, but also the predecessor. Alliances are completely different from the norm here, existing only for the duration of the war they were formed for, giving players more flexibility in the friends they make, for what purpose, and for how long. This doesn't mean there's a lack of peacetime diplomacy, however, as you'll still be signing defensive pacts, making invasion plans, arranging royal marriages, and dealing with relationships between vassal and liege. These types of conversations make a wartime alliance more likely, though none of them guarantee it, and this means you'll need to maintain good relations for when you need help in war. Wars in Knights of Honor 2 always have two sides, or alliances, and each alliance has one leader with room for several supporters. The supporters can either be part of the war right off the bat, or they can join later depending on any pre-existing pacts, and any existing defensive pacts are always visible to all kingdoms so they know what to expect when declaring a war. When a kingdom is attacked, all of their defensive pact signatories join in as supporters to defend right away. On the flip side, invasion plans are another type of diplomatic action that allows a leader to collect allies against a future enemy. These are prepared in secret, and once the leader pulls the trigger on an offensive war, all the signatories to the invasion plan join in as supporters of the attacker right away. Apart from joining right off the bat, however, like I said earlier, supporters can also be drawn into the war afterwards, though the how or why has not yet been revealed. Diplomacy can be used to demand the support of a kingdom in war, but it should be noted that alliances can be left or disbanded as a war goes on, at the cost of relations with the allied parties, as well as your own reputation and authority. The end of a war can only be negotiated between the two leaders on either side, and should they agree on terms, a peace will be signed between the two alliances, including leaders and supporters. Apart from that, however, the supporters in a war are able to contact the leader of the other side to broker a separate peace deal to leave the war, as mentioned before. The devs have mentioned wanting to implement switching sides in the middle of a war as an ultimate form of betrayal as well, and I would love to see that included, though it hasn't quite been confirmed yet. Outside of war and alliances, diplomats are able to take actions and apply effects that help them solve a plethora of potential problems. Brokering defensive pacts and developing invasion plans are exclusive actions for the class, but each diplomat can only form and maintain a single pact or plan, meaning you'll have to be picky as you prepare for war or the threat of it. Diplomats are also able to improve relations between you and other realms, they can help negotiate peace, and they can also help with internal affairs, doing well to govern a province and developing multiple aspects of it. They are key to helping improve opinions among the people, and they're also the ones who look for spouses for members of the royal family. It's something that a player can manually do, but diplomats can speed up and ease the process. As you can imagine, by virtue of the era things are set in, marriage plays a very important set of roles. The marriage of a king helps them uh, generate more family members, each with their own uses, while princes and kings married to foreign royals can see territorial claims be inherited, and marrying off your own princesses to foreign royals can help your own realm gain prestige by association, while marriages between royals in general will also, as you can expect, improve relations between realms. But diplomats and brides aren't the only thing you can send into another realm's court. Let's talk about spies and espionage. Your spies are an essential tool in accomplishing goals in less than savory ways. You're able to send a spy into any kingdom, and though they'll never really join the target kingdom's court, they can bribe the people in it to help perform tasks. Upon arrival, a spy immediately gives vision across a kingdom, including the position of their armies. Right off the bat, you can see how important espionage is, especially as you prepare for war. Beyond this, they also start collecting rumors about the kingdom being infiltrated. These reveal future plans they might have, any weaknesses or issues they're suffering from, etc, etc, though we haven't quite been shown how this information manifests itself or how it can be acted upon. What kind of weaknesses are revealed? Do we find out if they're suffering from a potential rebellion and then we can act upon it with a click of a button? Very curious to see how this plays out, so I'll be keeping an eye out for any more information as and when it gets revealed. Either way, with some cost, Spies are also able to ruin relations between kingdoms, which has a very tangible effect, and as time goes on, a spy will also see opportunities to pursue things like murder plots or the provocation of wars. As mentioned before, 
Bribing enemy knights is another potential move for spies to make, and a successful bit of bribery will open up even more opportunities depending on the target's class and responsibilities. A bribed merchant can help rob the treasury, while a bribed marshal might inspire revolts across the kingdom, while bribed spies can help in performing particularly challenging assassinations, like that of the royal family itself. Governors can open gates during sieges, and if you manage to bribe somebody who eventually rises to a significant seat of power, there are implications of some interesting events coming from that, but we haven't been told exactly what. All this sounds well and good, but of course, it's not without its risks. Spies are all about, as per the devs, high risk, high reward. Revealed plots will have huge implications on foreign relations and crown authority. Spies can be captured, imprisoned, and killed, and their actions are expensive to execute to begin with. But if things work out, you're looking at a very powerful set of tools. A set of tools so powerful, in fact, that they can be turned off for multiplayer, because we all know how things can go otherwise. Detailed Trade Systems I feel like trade often gets little love in these types of games, despite how essential it was and how it literally drove major decisions from time to time. In Knights of Honor 2, we're seeing trade get a fair bit of love with some detailed, intertwined systems. The merchant class, as can be expected, is used to help bring gold into the realm, but there are a few different ways this can play out. As suggested earlier, having a governor of the merchant class will improve the gold income and commerce within a province as trade caravans and ships start to visit the nearby towns, bringing in gold as long as they don't get intercepted by rebels or bandits en route. Merchants can also be sent on missions to establish and maintain trade with specific kingdoms where a trade agreement has been signed. Good relations as such are essential, and good relations and good trade go hand in hand, benefiting each other as they are each improved. The more time a merchant spends in one foreign kingdom, the better the returns become, but if a new opportunity shows up, a merchant is absolutely able to return home and head towards a new kingdom to take advantage of said new opportunity at the cost of losing all the work done at the kingdom they were previously in. But this is all sort of more generic trade talk, the generation of wealth through the movement of not-so-specific goods, so to speak. Merchants can also chase very specific goods for very specific benefits. These goods and resources are needed for the construction and function of some buildings, for recruitment of troops and more, so ensuring you have access to key resources through import or self-sustenance is essential, and as you can imagine, there is money to be made on export. As an example, food is needed to maintain armies, population growth, and happiness, so it can play quite a key role in a realm's economy, acting as a stable source of income if they're producing a surplus and exporting. All this trading and moving of goods requires a kingdom to have a high kingdom commerce parameter, a number, presumably, that is maintained by building more trade-related buildings and by picking the right traditions, skills, governors, etc, etc. I'll be curious to see exactly how commerce works, since it sounds like the player will be responsible for balancing its use between generic use by merchants and more specific goods trades. Beyond all this, the final element about trade to discuss are the opportunities for merchants that will arise from time to time. These will be somewhat random events that come up from time to time based on circumstances. If an army is near a kingdom or province you're trading with, a merchant might try and secure supplies for said army, or perhaps a risky but lucrative trade opportunity might come up, or at other times, the opportunity might come up to uh, hire mercenaries through your merchants, or maybe convince a mutual trade partner to stop trading with a third party. As you can see, trade is more than just a matter of reaching out to a neighbor and opening up trade deals and routes. There's an involved process, there are random events, and there are administrative implications to trade as well. I'm really quite curious to see how it'll all come together in practice, but what we've heard so far seems very promising. But in Knights of Honor 2, you won't just be trading goods, you'll also be trading blows. War War is, as you can probably expect, a major part of Knights of Honor 2, and I quite like how it sets itself apart from many other games in the genre. We already touched on how alliances, defensive pacts, and invasion plans work in setting the opposing sides of a war up for conflict, and once war kicks off, you'll notice some familiar as well as unfamiliar systems at play. While all classes of characters are able to raise armies and lead squads with the right military skills, your marshals will be able to recruit and lead armies by default, they'll always have access to more squads in their army, as well as more bonuses and military-specific skills, and they'll always inspire the troops more than other types of commanders, ensuring higher morale among their soldiers. 
Marshals cost money to maintain, as do the squads they lead, and that holds true for squads led by any general, of course. And while your marshals come from your court, the squads are recruited from towns in your kingdom at the cost of food and population, as well as a specific specialty resource for special unit types, like horses for cavalry. Squads are able to level up over time to improve their attack, defense, stamina, and morale stats, meaning there's an added incentive for keeping your squads alive from battle to battle. There's a variety of unit types, each with their own pros and cons, and you'll see those reflected in battle as well as on the campaign map. Cavalry moving swiftly to crush multiple rebel armies across your realm, for example, compared to their infantry counterparts. Unique cultural units are being included as well, and you can expect to see special units like the Mongol Heavy Lancers riding against the Novgorodian Boyars or Camel Riders walking the sands of North Africa side by side with Mamluk Cavalry. But fair enough, that's how your armies are made and led, but what do they actually do when war is afoot? As mentioned previously, the world is split up into provinces, and at the heart of these provinces are single towns, with smaller surrounding villages around them. To occupy a province, that central town needs to be taken. Usually this involves a siege where the defenders might surrender after a certain amount of time, or they might be driven to sally forth instead, or perhaps the attackers will decide to mount an assault if impatient. Once a town and its province is occupied, neither its previous holder nor its new occupier will glean any non-military benefits from it. Occupation isn't the same as ownership, and during the dark days of a forced occupation, you can expect to see migration, dropping stability, and even rebellions. The occupying kingdom can send soldiers in to bolster the local garrison, and though they can't recruit locally, they can use military buildings in the province to help hold it. Presumably this applies to facilities rather than access to manpower, so I'm just guessing here, there are no examples given, but perhaps uh, towers or keeps and things like that will help you give benefits to your troops, which is how you'll be able to use military buildings without actually being able to recruit any soldiers, for example. Beyond all this though, the occupier will need to get full-fledged ownership to get all the benefits of the province to apply. Naturally, the original owner can attempt to push the occupier back to restore control of the province, and depending on the loyalty of the province, some of its citizens might join in the fight as militia. If the population is particularly loyal, they won't even wait for their old sovereign to send an army in, and will rise up in rebellion themselves. Either way, when the occupier is pushed back and the province is restored to its original owner, it resumes functioning as normal, though the hit to stability stays, needing to be improved over time. But if you're fighting an offensive war, chances are you're not just looking for temporary occupations, but permanent conquests instead. A forceful and complete annexation can occur if the attacker occupies all of the initial owner's lands, though things get messy if the provinces are occupied by a mix of the attacking leader and their supporters. Either way, complete occupation of a realm isn't necessary in order to see land be exchanged. Kingdoms can attempt to broker a peace treaty that sees the transfer of some land instead, allowing for slow and steady growth and conquest. Provinces can be annexed in the middle of an ongoing war using specific actions as well, though these actions can be a little bit more forceful and questionable, and as such, they can draw the ire of other kingdoms who see you as a bit of a conquest-hungry ruler. However the attacker manages to do it, once a province is entirely under their control, there is still work to be done to restore the conquered province. We've discussed quite a few of those factors over the course of this video, so you might be able to put together the great variety of issues that await the conquering king. Religious and cultural turmoil, loyalty to the previous king, the need to increase stability, etc, etc. The hope is that this helps pace the conquest of the various kingdoms, forcing them to tend to their newly conquered lands, lest their entire realm fall apart from the inside. Alright, that was a lot to talk about and digest, and we didn't even touch on how the developers insist that everything is open to modding in this game, from starting scenarios to kingdoms, and we didn't really dive into the up to six player multiplayer that allows for co-op play, team games, and free-for-all. Some of those elements are still being fleshed out, and you can bet I'm keeping an eye on those too, but for now, I feel like there's enough here to look at, know, and discuss. So, what do you think? Are you as excited for Knights of Honor 2 as I am? Are you concerned about anything or looking forward to anything in particular? Let me know down below. I'm always curious to know what other people think, so feel free to drop a comment and uh, let's have a conversation down below. Now, if you're interested in keeping up with Knights of Honor 2 and more strategy gaming news, previews, reviews, let's plays, and more, make sure to subscribe to the channel. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. 
Until next time, cheers.